Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. Just another manic Monday, as they say, right? And uh, that's Marco Mangelsdorf on the phone from ProVision Solar in Hilo. And it's, a, it's the noon block, and it's Energy 808, the cutting edge. Hi, Marco. I feel once again so honored to be on with my good friend Jay Fidel. <laughs> I'm always wondering, now what are we going to talk about interesting today? And yet we always find too many things that we just don't have enough time. So let's give it another try. <laughs> That's a true statement. I wouldn't argue with any of that. Okay, let's begin with uh, the, the fate of Honua Ola biomass burning power plant uh, at Hamakua. What's going on with that? Well, before we do that, I just wanted to uh, share with people the little factoid from last week since we've been talking on and off over the past weeks about the fate of Pune Geothermal Venture, the oh, yes. uh, geothermal power plant in uh, the Pune area here. They were fined last week uh, for um, 11000 dollars by State Department of Health for an emissions violation that obviously took place prior to them shutting down in the first days of May. So they weren't the only ones. Say AES on Oahu and a number of other companies were fined as well. But just uh, worth noting that uh, apparently sometimes uh, or sometime in the past when they have been producing geothermal power that uh, their emissions were beyond certain threshold and uh, the state uh, fined them for that. So moving on to another power plant. Wait, before you go, I just have to say, isn't that, isn't that like kicking somebody who's down? <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, you're an attorney, and I think it's more uh, more about applying the law. I mean, if there is a violation that took place that was demonstrable and provable and credible, uh, then uh, that's what the State Department of Health is supposed to do. Is there no clemency here in River City? Is, is there no extenuation and mitigation? It just seems like they're kicking somebody who's down, who's suffering enormous losses. Enormous losses, which are... Uh, probably substantially offset by the business interruption insurance, which they have. So uh, I'm not going to cry too many crocodile tears for the <laughs> folks that are that. Okay. I, I don't see a lot of sympathy there. Okay, let's move on to uh, Hamakua. So one of the interesting things, you know, and I've been following this power plant for, for quite a number of years, and let's give it a little bit of history. So for decades, the Hilo Coast Power Company, up in Pepekeo, up uh, going northwest from Hilo, uh, had been using the refuse of post sugar, sugar cane harvesting, which you and I both know as the B word, as in bagasse. Mm -hmm. They had used bagasse as a fuel source there at the power plant up until 1994, which, as we both know, was essentially the end of sugar cane, sadly, here on this island after many, many, many decades of sugar cane being a very important part of the community, important part of the uh, the economy. In fact, my grandfather worked in cane his entire life from when he moved in Hawaii, moved to Hawaii in 1925 to his passing in 1989. Wow. So wow. interesting little factoid there. Well, thank you. Uh, after 1994, no more bagasse to be had, Hilo Coast Power switched to, can you guess what fuel source? Say it again. Can you guess what fuel source they switched to after they ran out of bagasse to burn? Oh, I, I, I would imagine, uh, well, no. Uh, I would imagine some kind of fossil fuel. Coal. Yeah. Burn coal. They burn coal here on the Big Island from 1994 roughly to 2004 when Hilo Coast Power uh, shut down and the, the power plant was, uh, was deactivated, so to speak, for uh, since then. And so for 14 years, there's been no power coming out of that power plant. And folks on the mainland decided a number of years ago, gee, we can make money if we revivify the plant there, a Hilo Coast power plant. And what else can we burn? Let's see. Hmm, we don't want to burn coal anymore. How about we burn trees, uh, a.k.a. biomass, that, that are grown nearby? And they signed a deal a number of years ago, uh, I think it was 2012-ish, uh, with Helco to reanimate the plant and sell Helco the power under a long-term power purchase agreement at roughly 28 cents a kilowatt hour, burning biomass, locally produced biomass. Wow, 28 and cents, yeah. 28 cents, right? Well, keep in mind that this was prior to the days of renewable energy coming down as much as they have come down in the past handful of years. Mm -hmm. And 
they were moving forward with that plant. They were spending money. This mainland company, whose name escapes me for the moment, was spending substantial money bringing the plant back into operation. And yet they also failed to meet a number of contractual deadlines. And Helco, in my opinion, was more than generous, more than understanding, more than tolerant of multiple instances of not meeting contractual deadlines. Finally, Helco had had enough. They canceled the contract. They were sued by uh, Honua Ola, also known as Hu Honua. They were sued for treble damages, which was going to come to somewhere around half a billion with a B, half a billion dollars. They were sued for breach of contract. That uh, I think was a negotiating ploy on their part. Helco and uh, this company sat down again to renegotiate terms. They came up with a different PPA at roughly 22 cents a kilowatt hour all in cost, which is, of course, less than 28. And Telco decided, well, we've done the best we can for our company. We've done the best we can for ratepayers. Now it's in the hands of the Public Utilities Commission. So I went to the PUC for review and approval, and much to my great surprise and dismay, the PUC uh, signed off on the power purchase agreement May of last year, May of 2017. And uh, they were moving forward. They, they, that was the trigger they needed to continue to spend substantial sums to bring the power plant back online. They hired my old friend Warren Lee, former, former president of Helco, prior to Jay Ignacio taking over 10 years ago. They hired Warren to be the president there. So Warren is now heading up their efforts to bring the power, pa power, power plant back online. So lo and behold, our friend Henry Curtis, uh, life of the land, mm -hmm. been a Enviro crusader for a very, very long time, done some good things there across the state. He filed a suit against the decision uh, on the part of the PUC to, to grant this power purchase agreement and his argument, which uh, his attorneys uh, made the argument to the Hawaii Supreme Court uh, a week or so ago, was that the commission erred they, they made a fundamental mistake in approving this power purchase agreement because they did not take into account the fact that this power plant, even if it's burning locally produced biomass, is going to be contributing to greenhouse gases and, and pollution, and that part of the state's goal, part of the state's stated strategy, state's stated strategy to reach 100 percent renewables by 2045, that there was an element uh, to that strategy and those goals to minimize the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted in, in pursuit of the, uh, the, the vaunted 100% renewables in, in, in power generation. So Henry, Henry's attorneys, I thought, made a very good argument. I've, I haven't heard, it, heard the verbal, uh, trans, I, I've read the transcripts, I haven't heard the, the audio. And I thought the, um, the, some of the justices there, there are five justices, of course, on our Supreme Court, uh, made some very, very pointed questions in terms of why didn't the commission, why didn't the state uh, take this into account. So, so the nub of the issue here is, in my opinion, Jay, is the the emissions that would come out of this power plant. Is it something to get uh, to? to is, is it reason to remand the peep, the decision to approve the PPA? Is, is this negligence or alleged negligence on the part of the the Public Utilities Commission to not take into account? <laughs> The pollution aspect of the power plant is this cause enough to effectively overturn the administrative approval uh, by the PUC of this PPA? Is this reason enough to do something rel relatively unprecedented, which is to overturn and remand back to the PUC through uh, judicial fiat uh, a decision that they made, uh, in this case, about a year and a half ago? So that's the nub of the issue, is, is this adequate grounds and according to Henry's attorney, yes, that's the case. According to the state's attorneys who argued against that, of course, they, they would make the counterargument. But the, the, the critical question is, does this justify, has this reached a bar where the Supreme Court can and should remand this approval of this power purchase agreement back to the Public Utilities Commission for reconsideration? Wow. That's, that's got some real moment to it, doesn't it? They're saying it's not consistent with our goals and all that, even though specifically, I mean, I don't think that uh, uh, biomass is um, outlawed. It's just maybe arguably not consistent with our goals, our clean energy goals. 
Um, I wonder, you know, they've taken a policy position on something the PUC has dealt with in its, in its own, on its own. So what do the government say? Um, or rather, shall I, yeah, what do the PUC say? They must have been represented in this hearing. Well, the, the PUC was represented by the state's attorney, yeah. and state attorneys, and I, can't, I don't remember verbatim the counter argument, uh, but I mean, it, it would be a, a very big deal. And in fact, I can't think of the last time since statehood, and I haven't taken a deep dive into to the database on this, but I can't think of a time, at least since I've been here for going on 20 years, where a court in Hawaii, whether it's been the Intermediate Court of Appeals, whether it's been the Supreme Court, has effectively overturned and remanded back to the commission a decision that the commission made. So it would be a very, very big deal if this were to be the case. And I, I can't speak for, for who Honua Ola and, and the, the money source and the investors uh, on the mainland who are spending the money to bring the power plant back. But this represents to me a substantial wild card that as they're continuing full speed ahead to bring the, the power plant online sometime in 2019, how much of a risk, how much of a liability do they assign to the possibility of an adverse decision from the uh, the Supreme Court, the Hawaii Supreme Court, that they would remand it back to the commission for reconsideration? And if that were to happen, I mean, that would really be, I think, quasi-catastrophic for the power plant because that would set things back for months and uh, – they're, they're under a timetable, and they've already lost a substantial amount of money, I think, the fact that they haven't been able to get online sooner. So I think it's a fairly big deal, and to what extent we do take into account, is there a difference between greenhouse gases that come from a smokestack that's being used to burn a fossil fuel versus a, a, a biomass product? I mean, and I don't know that the science, you know, per, per one BTU of coal burned compared to one BTU of a, a tree burned, uh, you know, do you differentiate that some pollution is better than others, is some pollution worse than others, depending on what you're burning? So I, I think it's a really juicy question. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It'd be uh, juicy to find out what the PUC said in its order, because uh, you, you were using the term uh, that the PUC should have, arguably should have, con you know, considered um, you know, the, the fossil fuel aspect of this deal. Uh, maybe it did uh, to some extent. Maybe it's, um, you know, in the, the decision. On the other hand, maybe it isn't. Um, no, they did not take into account. My recollection of reading the DNO from May of last year is that there was no discussion of, of, uh, of putting stuff into the, the atmosphere. They were uh, they, they made the they, they came to the decision and the approval on on, on other grounds. So there mm -hmm. was I, I don't recall any discussion in terms of thou shalt you know the yeah. thou shalt be permitted to burn this but not that. I mean, there's also been some discussion in the contract. Or, or Henry has made note that. Uh, the folks that, uh, if it were to go online at Honua Ola, that it's possible they could use biomass coming not from this island, but from some distance, possibly greater distance. So if that's the case, how much sense does it make to bring biomass in from hundreds, if not thousands of miles away if there happened to be a shortfall of biomass, i.e. trees, to fuel the power plant here? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, if if the Supreme Court says, uh, why don't you, why don't you, um, you know, consider that, uh, take it into account, uh, depending on the language of that of that particular decision, uh, maybe the PUC can say, okay, all right, we looked at it, we looked at all the possibilities, all the options, all the considerations, and as far as we're concerned, it's still good, and it's still consistent with moving toward a green energy future. Uh, on the other hand, the Supreme Court says, no, you can't do that. You can't do this kind of deal anymore. There can be no b biomass. Um, that, would be, that would be pretty stiff. I'm not sure they would do that. But well, you're right. We've got we to gotta watch and see what happens. One of the differences would be that on this particular commission, uh, our friend Jenny Potter is a commissioner, whereas last year, in May of last year, Jenny Potter wasn't on the commission. You had Jay Griffin, you had Randy Awase, and you had uh, our friend Tom Gorak. So there's a different makeup 
of the commission. Uh -huh. uh, and it's a different time now compared to a year and a half ago because the, the regulatory environment in terms of renewables coming down in cost, uh, you know, it, it's, it's rapidly evolving. So uh, I, I think, like I said earlier, I think if, if, the commission, if the Supreme Court were to rule that there was a procedural flaw because the commission did not take into account greenhouse gas emissions in their decision, then they would say that there's a flaw. We're not telling you what to do, but you must at least consider these important factors in your decision. I think if they were to do that, it would be, it would be earth shaking. I believe here because, like I said, that would be relatively unprecedented, and it would really set this project back. Probably, my, my guess is, is you know, quasi death blow. Well, it would also, uh, but also move us move us further toward a a pure green energy future, wouldn't it? Um, all of a sudden, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, energy generation wouldn't be um, wouldn't be nearly as feasible, and I I doubt an entrepreneur, an investor, would want to try it again. I doubt the, uh, the PUC would want to try it again. So we're, we're in a new world because of this, this case, and, and we'll be in a very new world if, um, if the Supreme Court uh, rules uh, against uh, Hohunua. Um, very interesting. But you know, there's another issue before we run to a break, Marco. You got two lawsuits, right? You got a lawsuit for, what did you say, $200 million um, by Hohunua against um, uh, whoever's Whoever's holding they dropped it, up. it. Huh? They dropped it. They dropped the lawsuit after Helco agreed to a revised power purchase. Oh, got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. I see. All right. So it's left with Henry Curtis's lawsuit, and that will de determine the future of this plan. Let's tell. Oh, I want to ask you one more question before we leave it, and that is, what is the difference environmentally? You know, in the larger sense, environmentally, be between burning bagasse and burning biomass, is it the same thing? Excellent question. I don't. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Well, given that, we'll take a break. That's Marco Mangelsdorf. He's with Provision Solar. He joins us every two weeks on Energy 808. We'll be right back after this break to talk about more very interesting developments in the energy landscape. Hey, Stan, the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stand Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Okay, we're back on Energy 808 on a given Monday morning with Marco Mangelsdorf from ProVision Solar. He joins us uh, by Zoom from Hilo. And uh, we're talking about various really interesting things that have happened. Um, let's talk about the next one on the agenda here. What's up with Tesla, electric vehicles, and battery storage? And I guess, you know, you could throw in hydrogen too, because that's always involved. The Germans were here last Tuesday. They had a big uh, conference at the East-West Center. Uh, the what is it? The German Hawaii Energy Clean Energy Symposium, uh, and one of the big panels and discussions was about how all this interacts with hydrogen. Anyway, so what's going on with Tesla? Well, there's some pretty big news. I mean, you know, and full disclosure, I'm a Tesla certified installer along with a number of other providers here in the state. So I do have something of a vested interest, and I also have a Tesla Powerwall on my home uh, that provides me backup power with my PV photovoltaic system if and when there's a utility outage uh, here in, in Hilo or in my neighborhood. So the big news uh, a couple of weeks ago was that Tesla announced their uh, third quarter earnings in terms of both revenue and income, and for only the second time in Tesla's history, they were profitable 
in Q3 to the tune of somewhere over $300 million, which uh, was something that uh, Elon Musk and his crew and uh, everybody involved with Tesla worked very hard to do to move a lot of product, both vehicles and battery storage, during the third quarter. So. Uh, Elon Musk himself has said it's critically important that we be profitable. So in the way you get to one year is where the profitability is you start with the first quarter and the second quarter and third quarter until you get to four quarters. So you've got to start somewhere. And I believe that uh, you know I'm not prescient enough to say whether I think they've turned the corner definitively because they have a number of big challenges ahead of them. But that company is, is on to something, I think. And the... I won't call it a revolution because that, I think, is massively overused as an adjective or, or noun, but I believe battery storage is uh, going to be kind of the new holy grail for renewable energy and for being able to offset uh, the t- type of power plants such as Huhonua uh, or Honua Ola up the coast here that's, like we talked about, going to burn biomass if it comes online, or PGV, which uh, uh, the 25 megawatts of if PGV were to come back online is at, at, a, at an avoided cost rate, which is higher than what solar plus storage is coming in these days. So there is a the, the, the wave that Tesla and others are riding, including folks in, in uh, China and South Korea in terms of these gigafactory size plants that are on the board are actually uh, uh, close to being in operation, that energy storage is a way to be able to turn uh, what is traditionally non-firm power, such as blowing wind on on wind turbines or solar panels, to turn non-firm power into more firm power. So we're not quite there yet. We're not there yet in terms of a solar plant having enough battery storage to, let's say, go through a 24-hour, 12- or 24-hour cycle. But uh, we're getting closer and closer, you know, uh, month by month and year by year as storage comes down in price and is... uh, I think going to be a real game changer as far as allowing renewable energy to be much more firm and uh, and help us uh, do what we need to do in terms of stop putting so much stuff into our atmosphere. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen it, but in Kauai, there's a, a Tesla battery facility that's just all over the landscape and is helping uh, KIUC uh, do relatively cheap uh, uh, photovoltaic, and uh, they've got a huge installation there, and I, I forget the exact amount, but it's relatively cheap, uh, way, way cheaper than uh, half, half as expensive as uh, what you were talking about with Ho'onua. Um, so, yeah, it's all about batteries, but, you know, hydrogen is close to that, and hydrogen is movable. I mean, uh, a battery is really heavy if you want to move it around. Hydrogen is light as gas. Um, where does that fit? Do you have any thoughts about where hydrogen fits in all this notion of moving into uh, photovoltaic with, with storage? Well, the number one question has to be, where does the hydrogen come from? You can't just dig a hole in the ground and have hydrogen come bubbling up and pressurized and put in tanks, right? Mm-hmm. It's what the, the Earth's most, uh, most uh, uh, prevalent element, I believe. Uh, we breathe in some hydrogen every time we, uh, we take a breath. But uh, where does the hydrogen come from? Well, one way it can be, what, one place to come from is you can take a uh, if I'm not mistaken, not being a chemist, you can take a uh, a natural gas uh, such as butane, propane, pentane, and you can you can carve out the the hydrogen from the CH molecules there. Uh, but that's taking a fossil fuel, and you have to take some you have to use some energy to, in order to be able to split that hydrogen off from the molecule. Another way to get hydrogen is to electrolyze water, which, uh, as we know, water is H to two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. So if you put an electric current through water, you split up the the molecule uh, into hydrogen and oxygen. So if there is a renewable way, if it's a cheap way, if it's an environmental friendly way to create hydrogen uh, here locally and not have to bring it in across great distances of the ocean in super high pressurized tanks, then that makes a lot of sense. And I know 
Um, Hank Rogers at his ranch and Paul Pontia and that, the group at Blue Planet have definitely been very interested in hydrogen. In fact, Hank has a hydrogen producing plant at his ranch here not far on the west side of the island. Yeah. So where is the hydrogen going to come from? And if it can come from a environmentally friendly place, if we could use, let's say, excess solar uh, to, be able to be able to electrolyze water, store the hydrogen, pressur- pressurize it, and use it as a fuel source, then it makes a lot of sense. Then you also have the part of the equation in terms of you need fuel cell vehicles in order to use the hydrogen, so it's kind of chicken and the egg. Who's going to bring over fuel cell vehicles here? And I know Hank very much wants to uh, if you don't have a, a fuel source or a hydrogen fuel source. So with Hank, of course, he's got his own hydrogen fuel source, but not everybody can pull up to Hank's fueling station and, and fuel up. So the, the availability of hydrogen here on this island at least, has been extremely, extremely limited. Therefore, those people who would be considering a Toyota Mirai, which is a fuel cell vehicle, or a Honda, uh, excuse me, Hyundai Santa Fe, because they also make uh, a fuel cell vehicle version of that SUV, you know, they got to think, okay, if I bring the car over, which would be way cool and run off of hydrogen, Where's it going to come from? Where can I go to fill up? And in California, uh, there are more and more hydrogen fueling stations. You can pull up a map and you can see little pins in the map uh, across the Bay Area, especially in the L.A., L.A., greater L.A. area, that there are places to go. But here on this island, I know of not one single one that's publicly available. And I know Surfco Pacific on Oahu, uh, they are putting together some rudiments of uh, infrastructure system to be able to fuel up the rise that they're selling. But it's coming, I think, way too way too slowly. I don't know if Stan Osterman, of course, I know. Knows well, we talked more. about it last week, actually. And uh, it appears that the Mirai is uh, going to go on sale and lease uh, through, I guess, Surfco. Um, and it's going to be relatively cheap. It's going to be something just over four hundred dollars, I think. Um, and it's um, it, it, it includes uh, maintenance, of course, as uh, as leased cars do. But it also includes a supply of hydrogen, uh, like yeah. up up to a certain dollar amount through the course of of the lease. The lease. Yeah. yeah. So that's pretty good. And of course, you have to you have to go out to Mapuna Puna, I guess where they will have this facility and pick up your hydrogen, um, which could be a pain. However, however, the, um, es- the original estimates of range on the Mirai are actually have, have been exceeded. And what I understand is that the Mirai is, is going to be doing like 340 or 50 miles on, right. on a, on a fill-up. That's pretty terrific. Now, the combination of, of EVs, which, of course, there are a lot more EVs than FCVs here in the state, but, I mean, I think it is an agreement that transportation is a much more difficult nut to crack in terms of really making a dent and having it go in a, in a much more renewable, much more environmentally friendly fashion. Yeah. So uh, I have no doubt there will be more and more electric vehicles. I have no doubt there will be, we're just seeing the beginning of fuel cell vehicles. In it. But it, unfortunately, you know, it's going to take time. And I think, uh, gosh, you know, as a species and as a planet, so we don't have as much time as we thought we had just a few, you know, no. handful of years ago. That's true. So. That's true. But, you know, remember there's a connection between these uh, vehicles, the electric vehicles and the hydro, hydrogen electric vehicles in the sense that um, they, they can power your house. And uh, there's one vehicle, uh, it's either here or coming, uh, that can actually do that, can power a building. Um, and it's just an ordinary vehicle, has a big supply of hydrogen. And that, that has an effect on exactly, you know, how do we handle, um, how do we handle uh, blackouts? If you had a supply of hydrogen to power your house, then you're not as concerned that the utility is having a blackout because of a storm. So this is this is all going to evolve. But you know what, Marco? We've done it again. We've taken a perfectly reasonable half hour, and we have only talked about really two things, or pa- possibly, depending how you count it, three things. And we've fritted away the time on these wonderful advances in clean energy in Hawaii. Um, and we have we have a, an agenda of two or three other things we haven't even touched. So I guess we'll have to do this again in two weeks and try to catch up. What do you think? So much to blab about, Jay, in so little time. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar in Hilo. 
uh, joining us by uh, Zoom, and we look forward to uh, we look forward to further discussion on so many issues. Thank you, Marco. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you. Take care.